This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium blockchain network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. To learn more, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, and welcome to Epicenter. My name is Brian Fabian Crane, and we're now five years in, basically, of doing this podcast. So we wanted to come together for kind of a special episode with just just the hosts, basically everyone uh, except me who's still on leave. So yeah, I look forward to the discussion. We're going to speak a little bit about uh, the some announcements. We're going to have some questions from listeners that we're going to respond to. And then we're going to speak a little bit about sort of our take about the blockchain space, where we're at and where things are going. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. So just before we get started and into the meat of things, I do want to mention uh, I was at the Hyperledger Global Forum in December in Basel, Switzerland, and uh, I was invited by the Linux Foundation to um, do some interviews with some people there and uh, recently released those interviews. So I there are five interviews that were released with Brian Bellendorf, Leanne Kemp, uh, Matthew Davey of a company called Kiva, uh, Doug Johnson Ponskin of a company called Circular, and Jesse Chenard of Monetigo. Um, and you can find those on our YouTube page. Uh, so they were published by the Linux Foundation and Hyperledger, but there's a playlist on our YouTube page. And you can also read uh, a takeaway article that I wrote uh, on our medium.com slash epicenter podcast. And all the takeaways from that event are there, including the videos if you want to find them. So yeah, it was, it was a really interesting event. Uh, definitely very different from the other events uh, we had attended in the recent months, you know, the DEF CON 4 and Web 3 and everything. It was, it was a very different vibe, but all nonetheless very interesting. So I hope you'll enjoy those interviews and, uh, and the content from that conference. So um, with that, just want to maybe spend a few minutes on the, uh, the recent announcement that we, we turned five. Uh, and uh, so we mentioned it in last week's episode, but maybe, maybe reminisce a little bit on, on the last five years of the show. I mean, for, for me, when I first started this, when, when I first got introduced to blockchain and, and Bitcoin, particularly back then, I was working as a user experience consultant. It was you know, a very, very different uh, career, I guess, uh, trajectory that I had uh, in front of me. But this discovering this space like just totally changed my life, and um, I guess for the better. Uh, I learned a lot. I think that's one of the things that I didn't mention last week. Thinking about it after listening to the episodes, that just how much I've learned in the last five years has been just tremendous. Um, not only about computer science and cryptography, but also just generally about finance and economics and the way that. Of global finance works and this sort of thing. And that's been really, really, um, really fascinating. Um, what about you, Brian? True, yeah. I guess that's something that maybe becomes more clear when you look back on things, you because know, just so interviewing so many people and, you know, you always do a few hours of research and then you interview them. It is a great way to learn. I mean, that was initially one of the reasons why I wanted to do the podcast, because I, you know, back then I learned about Bitcoin. I was like, oh, this is amazing. I want to do something in the... Bitcoin space, as it was called back then, and, and didn't really know what to do. But of course, I felt like, okay, learning is going to be key. Meeting people is going to be key. And interviewing them is a great way to do both. So uh, I think it certainly succeeded in, in that regard. Cool. Any, any favorite uh, moments during your five years at Epicenter, both of you? There's a lot of great moments. I, I think for me, it, it, it's not one moment in particular, but it's, it's you know, the, the five years has been punctuated by moments where I felt incredibly grateful and kind of humbled to be speaking with the person that I was speaking with. And I remember getting that on a few occasions. And one was the first time that we had David Andolfado on the podcast uh, three years ago, I think. Getting the opportunity to speak to a central bank economist and to be able to ask him questions in an open forum where I've have no formal training in economics or finance. Um, don't come from academia. I, I, it was just really, really a, a very intense experience. 
also speaking with people like Brendan Eich, who like founded Mozilla, uh, and even like Brian Bellendorf. Like when when I speak to for me, the, the the most humbling moments were those moments where I got to speak to people that founded the web and created the web, and who were there at that time. And uh, there's there's a lot of other occasions I think when that happened. Um, one moment I think that sticks out the most, uh, which is kind of a funny moment, kind of an anecdote. Uh, I was in Toronto once with a friend, um, and we'd been out drinking, and we were in a taxi, and we got in this taxi, and after a few minutes in the cab, uh, it was like an Uber actually, after a few minutes in the Uber, the guy looks in the rearview mirror, and although we had been speaking about nothing about blockchain or anything, he looks in the rearview mirror and he says, "Hey man, do you do a blockchain podcast?" <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he was actually like a blockchain consultant, you know, side job Uber driver. And uh, I remember my friend who didn't know much about the podcast kind of looked at me and was like, "Wait, wait a minute, is this guy recognizing you, <laughs> recognizing you in a taxi?" Uh, so that was one of the funny moments. Uh, I think I remember the most the last five years. Wow, that's super cool. Yeah, I think that's I, I think it's you know speaking to people who are expats in something other than you are an expat in. Uh, that's one of the hallmark the hallmarks of this of this uh, uh, ecosystem, right? Because it brings together so many diverse people that um, in most instances, when you talk to someone interesting, uh, they're an expat in something, and it's usually not the thing you're an expat in. So uh, yeah, I totally I totally get that. What about you? Brian, what what do you, what were your favorite moments? I mean, w one thing that came to mind when you asked that question um, is so you know years ago the space was was much smaller, and back then some people will remember that there was the whole Bitcoin scaling debate, which started many years ago, and I I just I remember when we did an episode with Mike Hearn, and. In the episode, and at the time, it wasn't really obvious that there was so much conflict within Bitcoin development. Like I think people weren't aware of it. And then he had he said this thing: "Oh, Bitcoin development had ground to a halt." And afterwards, there was these Reddit discussions with like hundreds of responses. And you know, it, it feels a little bit. I mean, I, I may be wrong about this, but at least uh, you know, it looked like that kind of came to the public attention, like all of these rifts that there were in the different directions, you know, that later led to the split with in to Bitcoin Cash and uh, and Bitcoin and then, you know, Gavin and Dreesen and Mike Hearn and others kind of leaving the community. So I felt like, you know, the podcast we did back then with you know with these people had this kind of role in that. So I think that's kind of, you know, an interesting thing. Um and I remember it that out to me. I remember that standing out to me as I mean, of course, in hindsight, but at, at the time thinking, wow, we're getting some attention because of this. Like, it was just, it was kind of surreal that this discussion that we had with this person on a Skype call was now making all these waves uh, and getting noticed on Reddit and all these other forums. And also what I thought was very cool uh, or cool in some weird way was when the SEC wrote this paper about the DAO and then like quoted the, our episode as like evidence <laughs> that the DAO was a security. So I thought that's pretty funny. That was that was also fantastic. <laughs> okay, so today I learned you both like drama and causing drama and stirring up drama. That's uh... well, we haven't we haven't caused that much drama. I think we've been pretty drama free, considering. Generally, people don't come on Epicenter to cause drama. There are other places where they can do that. But there's definitely some cases where people have said things where we thought, huh, this could maybe cause some drama, but then you know, didn't that much. Cool. For, for last week's episode, for the, for the introductory five-year five uh, episode, you said um, that you didn't see this coming. So five years ago, this would have felt daunting. Uh, knowing that you would actually have to put out an episode every week consistently for the next couple of years. Um, what was the point in time when either of you realized that you would be doing this for a while now? I think I'm still realizing it. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it might be worth mentioning that, uh, that you know, I, I left Stratum earlier this year and I spent most of the year kind of traveling and not really paying attention to blockchain very much. And 
when I started coming out of that, like later in the year, sometime around September or October, the only real thing that I felt like I wanted to do at, the, at this time was to spend more time on Epicenter and spend more time kind of like growing the business and growing the podcast and, and you know, and sort of generally working on the, the more business side of things, bringing on new hosts potentially. But yeah, un until then, it, it really felt kind of like a side project. You know, we were obviously had sponsors and we're generating revenue, but you know, never really paid ourselves or, or, you know, since I guess 20, maybe 14, 2015, when both Brian and I were not spending time on other projects, um, hadn't really felt that you know, this was something that, you know, we could do more long term. But now I, I, now more than ever, I think, like, I feel that, okay, there's still lots to do when I, when I have like, sort of my checklist of you know, all of these things that I need to check off in order for Epicenter to become a great business. From the beginning, you know, I thought this is something you have to do for kind of an extended period for it to make any sense, right? In so many ways, like, first of all, you get better over time. And then, you know, the building up an audience is a very gradual thing. I mean, you know, Sebastian mentioned a little bit like kind of podcasting as a, as a business. Well, I think podcasting as a business still today is in its like infancy, right? You really have the first companies you know, bigger podcasts, turning it into proper businesses in the last, you know, two years, three years, maybe there are very few that are a bit earlier. So I always felt it, it could be this like long-term thing. And so I, I, I mean, maybe I misremember, but I, I don't think it's so unexpected to me that we ended up, you know, doing this for such a long time. And, I think you know, maybe, your, your maybe views have changed about this though, because I remember when we were first when we first started talking about this early on my recollection is that and and maybe you were right at the time is my recollection is that you felt that this wasn't really a business that you could scale that much or at least if you were going to scale it you had to have like massive audience um but it's true that that has definitely changed in the last few years with the growth of podcasting in sort of the more general you know population whereas before it was kind of a niche thing yeah, I, I also one thing that I just think very strongly here is that podcasting is so limited at the moment uh, by the technology that it's run on. So basically the delivery through RSS feeds. So I think if you didn't have that, so, so that has a lot of implications, right? Like we can't, like we don't know exactly how many people you know, listen to the podcast. We don't control the the experience that the kind of user experience or the way that people consume it, right? So that is extremely limiting. And I do think the yeah, that's kind of just the way podcasts are delivered, you know, which is, I guess is historically based on Apple and iTunes and the decision they make and, and leveraging RSS standard. I think that's really confined podcasting enormously. And I think if it wasn't like that, you you would see so much more innovation and activity around podcasts. So I'm still in the back of my mind, always waiting. It's like when is a, an alternative going to come? Um, and it's interesting because I I recently read an article. I don't know if this data point is true, but it was in this article that in the U.S. the you know the industry size of podcasting is something like 300 million. You know, so that's the revenues across like all the podcasts. So it's really, you know, it's kind of tiny industry. But that in China, it's, I think, 20 times as big, right? Even though China is a much smaller economy uh, and, you know, much more um, not technologically as, as advanced or in some ways maybe it is. But just because there's totally different ways that podcasts are delivered and consumed there. And so, yeah, that's, that's one of the things I'm still, you know, hopefully somebody will crack this, but it's of course, extremely hard problem because people are so used to uh, the way they consume podcasts. So creating something different is. I think it is changing a little bit and we've seen it more in the last few years and there's a shift now towards, it kind of started with Stitcher and where now people are consuming with, with Spotify and they're consuming with, um, with well, Stitcher and Google Play and all these different platforms, 
I, of course, the majority of listeners still listen through the good old fashioned RSS feed, but we are, I think, seeing kind of a shift. And what would be interesting is if, if really the, the audiences sort of flatten out across all these platforms, what essentially would, would happen then is that we'd have a very decentralized type of distribution. Whereas if you look at sort of video distribution, if you're producing video today, the only game in town really is YouTube if you're you know, outside of China or like any market that has kind of a specific platform. And you can get deplatformed or like you lose your revenue very easily. Whereas with podcasting, it, the way things are going, I think that maybe in five to 10 years, things will be much more resilient. And you'll, as a, as a, as a content creator, you know, you'll have this multitude of platforms where you're publishing and maybe you know, revenue streams coming from different places. Yeah, but I, I don't think that's really the point. Because uh, even something like Spotify, you actually have no no control whatsoever about the experience. And, you know, in many other industries or many with many other products, you can say, okay, I'm producing this and I can, like, give you this product and you give me, let's say, a dollar or something like that, right? Which is something that, for example, in podcasting is, is basically not possible, really, in the way it's it's delivered. Uh, and I, I do think that's a big, you know, for example, that has meant that uh, podcasting is largely advertisement driven. And for example, I think in China, the way, the, the reason why this is a, so much bigger industry is because people, podcast producers can just charge people for listening to podcasts. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay. So more on the, yeah, I agree yeah, on the, on the, on the business model side of things. It's, it is difficult to produce stuff and, and charge for it. I mean, there are platforms to do it, uh, but but it's not inherent to the experience of the way that people listen to podcasts, which most people listen to podcasts today, which is the RSS feed. But uh, yeah, this is a, a, a whole other discussion. So we got some questions submitted from uh, some of you. So we wanted to address some of those questions. So one of them was, okay, so looking ahead to 2019, are there any guests in particular that you really want to have on the show? Or I think sort of related question to this Maybe, like, are there any areas that you're particularly interested in doing episodes about? Uh, one idea that I've honestly been, like, you know, just, like, kicking around in my head for a little while now is I thought it would be really cool to have a pseudonymous guest on the show. So, like, you know, I'm talking about, think about, like, you know, like, you know, Satoshi hasn't been, like, you know, pu very public for the past two, few years, kind of hard to get a hang of, uh, get, get, get reach of, but... Um, no, I think it'll be really cool to like, there's some co very cool, interesting pseudonymous teams working out there right now. So for example, like the Avalanche team or a lot of the Grin team. Um, and so, or, you know, even some individual contributors such as like, there's a guy named Dexran in the Ethereum Classic community or uh, Cobra Bitcoin is that, you know, he's very popular on Twitter. So I don't know, I just thought it would be really cool and like a novel, interesting experience to get uh, a new uh, and a, like a pseudonymous person on, and I also think it'll be just a very interesting technical challenge for us to like figure out how to do. Like, how are we going to do this? Is it going to be like some garbled speech thing? Is it going to be a text to speech? I don't know how this is going to work, and I just don't think that would be a very interesting and unique experience that I don't think I've ever seen any podcast do before. Yeah, you, you, you're mentioning that in our, in our Slack channel, and I think the most interesting aspect of that is is how would we actually prove that this person is who they say they are and how do we convey that to our audience in a way that they could trust that this person is actually who they say they are that's true i mean how do they, how do these people con like convince that anyways like when they're like just posting on message forums and stuff how do we know that the cobra bitcoin on twitter is the same as the one on reddit yeah, I mean, I guess they could they could just kind of tweet and say like, "Hey, I was on Epicenter <laughs> this week, and this is actually who I am." Yeah, I guess that that would be one way to do it. Yeah, um, and then if and beyond that, uh, another thing I really liked was um, I like uh, so far this year we started doing a lot more like you know spreading out a little bit from just like cryptocurrency projects, and we've been doing a lot of book authors lately, which I've all which I actually really found fun. I don't know, maybe it's something about like people who are really good at like writing their thoughts out on like like hundreds and hundreds of pages also really good at like speaking or something. But I, I always just thought the conversations we've had with book authors is, have always been really good. So I'd love to have some more of them on. Yeah, I agree. And what about you, Felica? 
I'm looking forward to so so basically, if you look at the uh, the cryptocurrency um, projects currently that have a lot of users, um, they're all exchanges. Um, so what I'm looking forward is to cryptocurrency projects. Uh, so that uh, that build DApps that have a lot of users. So basically, if you look at the usage of DApps currently, it's uh, at most a couple of hundred users per day uh, for the very top uh, for the very top DApps, and that's mostly decentralized exchanges, so say IDEX or so. But I mean, that's bound to happen. So we, we're bound to see DApps with, say, 50,000 daily users, probably, my, my guess would be like so, sometime mid this year. Um, and I find that actually having users using a platform typically matures projects a lot. So if, if you look at the prof professionality of, um, of people running big exchanges, um, there, there really is a gap to people who are building DApps just because there's, I mean, basically you grow with, with, with your number of users and your experience grows and your problems grow and um, hopefully you find solutions. And I think that's going to be, uh, that's going to be a super exciting uh, first, having someone on with a DApp um, that has a ton of usage. The other thing that, that I really look forward to is, um, seeing zero knowledge applications applications and uh, interviewing people who are building them uh, just because um there's a whole different set of challenges that comes with that such as uh, uh often ceremonies and toxic waste and things that most of us don't think about most of the time uh, the one thing that comes to mind that uh is I've been wanting to do for quite a while. It's just more episodes on Bitcoin. I feel we, you know, Bitcoin was very, uh, you know, one point something we talked about a lot. And I feel we've, uh, you know, done a really lot on Ethereum. And I think we've become sort of too overweight on Ethereum and, and haven't covered Bitcoin enough. So I'd be interested in doing some episodes about, you know, what's going on in Bitcoin development, like what are some of the technical things people are working on. Uh, I'd be interested in doing some Lightning work, Network episodes. I mean, we've done, I think, maybe two before, but it's been, the last one was probably two years ago. And I think there's a lot of development there that, you know, seems to maybe finally be somewhere near actual usage. So, yeah, I would like to, to do something, some things on that. Yeah, I echo that. And it's what I answered in one of the Reddit questions is I feel that we've been we've been commandeered by all the Web3 stuff and uh, for, you know, it, to some extent have kind of neglected Bitcoin. I actually like I'm, I'm honestly pretty you know, misinformed about what's going on in that space at the moment. You know, there was that whole thing with Bitcoin SV a, a little while back and we it probably should have covered it. That's like, not there's Bitcoin. a lot of drama happening. There. <laughs> that's not what Sorry? I mean. That that's not what. I mean. No, no, of course. Bitcoin I, that's SV, not, I definitely uh, don't. I know that's not what you mean. <laughs> uh, but but still, like there there are things happening in the Bitcoin space, and we haven't been paying particular attention to it. But also, like on the technical side, what's the state of you know, being able to build DApps on on Bitcoin, that sort of thing, or you know, what's the state of the Lightning Network? You know, what's the state of the different implementations there? Are people being are able to process payments? Uh, this sort of stuff. So yeah, maybe we should make that a a goal for twenty nineteen is to do at least five episodes about Bitcoin. If you've listened to previous episodes with Marley Gray and Matt Kerner, you know that Microsoft is committed to providing enterprise grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers. Well, the Azure Blockchain Workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks. Take the Ethereum Proof of Authority template, for example. It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible Proof of Authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure. So you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. 
To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, check out aka.ms slash epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. Given that the uh, question was uh, which guests in particular, uh, who would be maybe like, you know, let's say you could have like one dream guest on that like, oh my God, that would be such a reach. Like, it would be amazing if we could, I would love to do an episode with them. Who would that be for you guys? For me, I, I think early on, and I, maybe this was a little bit more revel, relevant a few years ago because it was a bit more vocal about it, uh, was getting someone like, Richard Branson, or um, his name escapes me, but the former Greek uh, finance minister. Varoufakis? Yeah, uh, Varoufakis. And recently, we kind of threw it around the idea of maybe getting Christine Lagarde uh, on the show, which would be just amazing <laughs> uh, to be able to speak to someone with sort of that level of um, visibility and sort of political experience and yeah, I think like those would be on my list. Yeah, I second that. So I, I would I would also have gone with real world people because it feels like people within the space, they're, they're usually super happy to come on. So there's no one really who's so far really resisted. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it is the people who are shaping the financial, uh, the financial world out there, other, you know, aside from, from, cryptocurrencies that uh, would also interest me most for me i guess uh i i would have to choose either between um the first would be peter thiel because i just you know i love his book zero to one and i just really like how he thinks uh he has like a very you know he's just like very you know pretty libertarian but like you know th he has his like own like little interesting take on it which i always th thought was a bit cool um and then my second choice would be uh, uh, Rick Falkvinge, who was the founder of the Pirate Party. Uh, I always, I, I, I always like was super fascinated by the Pirate Party. Once again, I really like his book, which is called Swarm Wise. And um, I even like so when I was a student at UC Berkeley, we had this like little student government thing called the ASCC, and so I actually uh, created a Pirate Party. So at Berkeley, there were there were like already political parties and stuff, like two big ones. And so I just, you know, me and a couple of other friends, uh, we created a, a new political party called the Pirate Party at Berkeley. And we ran and we actually won one of the seats on the uh, student government, which was kind of cool. So I don't know, Rick Falkman just seems really interesting to me. I really like uh, how he thinks. And I really like a lot of his work on like swarms. I think it's like a really, there's a really cool like comparison to be made on like, you know, swarms and DAOs to me seem like two different types of uh, decentralized organizations, but with like very different designs. To me, like DAOs are like safety favoring decentralized organizations, while swarms are liveness favoring decentralized or organizations, which I, I think this is like a cool concept. And I don't, and you know, a lot of people have been putting a lot of effort into like, you know, structuring using DAOs. But I think swarms are another really cool opportunity to explore as well. So would love to have, have him on. Interesting anecdote about Rick Falfinch is, one time, a long time ago, I think probably in our first year, we were short a guest and we needed a guest for the following Monday. And I don't know why Rick Falfinch came to mind. And I went on his website and there on his website was his mobile number. And I texted him. I was like, Rick, we're a blockchain podcast or a Bitcoin podcast back then. And we'd love <laughs> to have you on the show. Can you come on this week? And he never responded. So oh, no. you can find his phone number <laughs> on his website and try to get him on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's possible. Yeah. We, we should have him on. Um, uh, I suspect that we, that won't be an issue. Yeah. I have a few, uh, a few, I, I guess two actual people that come to mind. One is uh, Yuval Harari. So he wrote this book called uh, Sapiens and Homo Deus, which basically this book about sort of, you know, human history and the future of humanity. And it's just I mean, like an incredible pick. mind. Yeah, they're amazing books. And uh, he thinks so much about the trajectory of technology and where things are going. And, uh, and actually one of the things that, you know, stood out to me in his book is like, where's blockchain? And, you know, it was kind of missing but I heard him, I heard an interview with him more recently where he did mention it a bit. So I think he's probably become more familiar with it since he wrote this book. So I would love to, to have him on and, and learn a bit about sort of his thoughts about how blockchain and cryptocurrencies fit into 
you know, these broader uh, technological and societal narratives. Another person that comes to mind is, you know, Brian Armstrong. He, I think, hardly gives any interviews, right? You never see him on, on any podcast or anything like that. But it's just, he's built such a, an incredible company with Coinbase that has such a huge influence on the space. So, uh, you know, he, he would be great to have on. And then a third one comes to mind, but I don't know a particular person here, but I would be interested in hearing from somebody who comes maybe from a kind of a military background and who has some thoughts about, you know, like cyber warfare and, you know, the role that blockchain and cryptocurrencies could play in that and how kind of, you know, these type of organizations, you know, that think a lot about, you know, geopolitical conflict and how to get advantages over, you know, other nations, how they look at blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So, so yeah, if you know somebody. A- uh, the Swiss guy is asking about how to, like, you know, use cryptocurrency for war. Yeah, war <laughs> or maybe defend, defensive, right? You could potentially also use some blockchain system maybe to make your own country more resilient. But, you know, I also remember, you know, years ago I read this book called Currency Wars where he spoke quite a bit about, um, you know, kind of the way people can or countries can manipulate currencies in kind of, you know, economic warfare in a way. So it would be interesting to hear how, you know, how people like that think about it, although... Presumably, it will be very difficult to find somebody, you know, to come on to to actually speak about that. One thing that just came to mind, is, and I think probably is worth mentioning, because as listeners, you you don't really get access to this, but it, it you know we we've been consistently putting out episodes every week for two hundred and seventy weeks now, uh, except for one week. <laughs> you know, earlier or sort of in September of 2018 when we re-released an episode. Uh, but there have been a lot of times where it has come down to the wire where, you know, it's Monday or Tuesday and we don't have a guest or a guest cancels or something happens. So, you know, th- just, just know as a listener that there's a lot of effort that's gone into <laughs> making sure that every week there's an episode <laughs> and there's been a lot of near misses. And there's a lot of times where I'm sure I've lost hair over thinking about <laughs> what we're going to do this week. But um, yeah, it's, I think it's gone pretty well. But it, there's a lot of a, it's, it's a lot of a lot of sweat has been sh- uh, shed from trying to get episodes every week. Sometimes. So we got another question about, and and I think I'll you know I'll ask the question. I'll, I'll also briefly answer it, uh, and maybe maybe some of the other people can also weigh in. But what criteria in forum? Uh, our choice for guests and topics. And I think there's a few things. Um, Of course, you know, how interesting is the idea? Is it something big and novel? And if it works, could it like fundamentally change the blockchain space or the world? So that's certainly one thing. And then, you know, the quality of the project, you know, are they, have they worked on this for a long time? Are they like serious about it? Uh, Was this just showed up and want to do an ICO or something? Um, and then something that has changed, at least for me, is that I now really kind of prefer projects to come on a little bit later in their life cycle. So I think in the past, we often had projects on when it was just like a white paper. And at the time, that was necessary because projects were just much earlier on in their, in their stage, right? So they, there were fewer projects that were more advanced. Uh, and there was just less going on in the space. But now I feel like we've gotten to a point where there's really a lot of quality projects and they, they tend to be further advanced. And, you know, when we have a project on, generally we have them on once. And only if they become something huge, like let's say Ethereum, we have them on again. So I feel, you know, when people come early on, often I'm like, you know, let's re- revisit it in like six months or a year. And I, I don't think I've ever regretted that. I think it's always been good that they have some more time to like actually build out something or something you can actually use and see. 
I mean, Dharma is an example here, right? We did the Dharma episode. I mean, I met uh, the Dharma almost a year ago when they were just starting out. And I think Ryan Zur at the time was like, say, hey, meet these guys, you should have them on Epicenter. And, uh, and, you know, when I met them, it was clear, okay, at some point, probably I wanna, should have them on. But I think it was good to wait for them to develop. And, and I think it was a better episode because of that. Yeah, I totally agree. And, uh, and I, I do want to say that, Brian, you've been a really great filter for filtering out potential bad content on Epicenter. Um, I know myself, uh, you know, Mayher and, and, and all of us have suggested episodes and you've, you've been really good at like putting your foot down and saying, no, we're not going to do this because this is going to be a bad episode or I don't think this is interesting. And we sort of have to go back into our, go back to the drawing board and try to suggest something else as, a, as an episode. Thank you for that. Okay, so another question was, okay, what what 10 blockchains will be around five years from now? Friedrike, what are your thoughts? Uh, that's mean picking on me like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there are a couple where I am fairly certain they're going to be around. So I'm pretty sure Ethereum in some uh, shape or form is going to be around. Pretty sure Bitcoin is also uh, going to be around. And this is this is... Um, a little bit where the uncertainty where the uncertainty for me creeps in. So there there are a number of contenders after that. Um, things like uh, Zcash and uh, yeah, then 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 it goes downhill quickly from there. So uh, th th there are a lot of uh, so five years. Uh, actually, you know what you know what. Let me rephrase. So I think in five years, a lot of the um, a lot of the chains that we see today are going to be around. I don't think um, a lot of them will have died by then. Um, I think uh, a lot of them will have become marginal, though. So I'm pretty sure that things like EOS and Zcash and Monero uh, and uh, all their friends are still going to be around in some some form. Uh, I just don't think they, their stake is going to be as big. So I've made it to five. Um, so may maybe now uh, <laughs> Sunny can jump in. So I guess, you know, my vision is always that I think that there's going to be a lot of chains in a couple of years. Um, but, you know, I would say one of the things that I definitely think is the things that have the most staying power is are the things that have the most meme power. And so the things that have the strongest memes are probably what's going to stay around for a long time. So I think Bitcoin has a great meme around it, like this whole like digital gold thing it has going on. Um, I think Litecoin has like a great meme around it. It's like, you know, it's the silver to Bitcoin's gold. Is it like any technologically That's better? That's a horrible no. meme, man. No. I don't know. It, it, it's working. It's been working for like years. <laughs> and like w explain to me why Litecoin is like, you know, top five on coin market cap or whatever it is now. Like, but like, you know, it's, it, it's I, know, I always found Litecoin so fascinating because it's just like, you know, it is it's bringing almost nothing to the table from a technological standpoint. It is the only thing it is bringing to the table is this pure meme. And that somehow has been giving it value. Like, or, or, you know, let's, how, if we put this question in the reverse, which coins from five years ago are still kicking it today? And Litecoin is one of them, right? Like it is one of the coins that's like over five years old that's still in like, you know, the top five, top 10 in coin market cap. So, you know, meme power works. And so, you know, that's why I'm still long Dogecoin. I think that also ties into an interesting question, which is how do blockchains die? And I think for a long time, people had this idea, oh, blockchains are always around, right? There's always going to be like some kind of trading of blockchains and, you know, somebody mining it, even if nobody uses it. And I think what we are seeing now, and I think what we will see a lot is actually blockchains dying. And I think we're seeing it a little bit with, uh, you know, we see side of the, the process by which has happened, at least for proof of work blockchains, this may be different for proof of stake blockchains. But right, for proof of work blockchains, uh, if they all use the kind of same mining hardware, it becomes extremely cheap to attack it, right? And to like double spend it. So then I think you have exchanges trading these coins and easily an attacker can go in and they can, you know, for little money, they can do a, a huge reorganization and basically scam the exchange. And that just happened with Ethereum Classic, which, you know, isn't even such a small chain. 
So, and then I think last year it happened quite a bit with, with smaller blockchains, but I think that's going to probably happen like, you know, at scale and then they get delisted from exchanges. Then like, hey, you know, there's really no point anymore mining it, right? There's no revenues. So I think you will have this kind of gradual death of many, especially smaller proof of work chains. And and of course, developers abandoning the chains happens all the time, right? I think that we've had for a long time. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, you know, I, I've been like, you know, relatively decently like you know involved with the ethereum classic community for a while and you know it's been very interesting to see the the state of that chain in the past year so everyone's you know uh there's a lot of hoopla around like the whole 51 percent attack this week but i think uh one thing that may have went under the radar for a lot of people was about a month and a half ago like uh there was a huge like you know uh, kind of like split between a lot of the dev, dev teams. And so one of the things that happened in Ethereum Classic was there was like a lot of dev teams working on it. Um, but then like, it seems that like over time, a lot of the dev teams just started splitting off and working on like other stuff. Like, you know, IOHK started working on like, her, you know, kind of like shifting 100% of their focus towards Cardano. Um, you know, there was a lot of like conflict on like some of the stuff. And so, yeah, I think to me, I think really think it's like when the developers stop caring about it, and the community is just not there, ready to pick it up. That's kind of when things start to die off. I wish will be the MySpace of blockchains in five years. Uh, I think it's like, you know, to your point, Brian, is when blockchains start to die. Uh, well, what 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 constitutes the dead blockchain, um, and by what metrics do you you know qualify a blockchain to be dead? Uh, you know, if there's still some activity on it or not. One question I think maybe is interesting is to consider what new types of blockchains might emerge that we might find unlikely. So I was recently, like I said, at this event, and there's this blockchain in Switzerland that is that was built by like Swisscom and the Swiss Post, and it's regulated, and people are building uh, applications on top of it for um, trading like sh equity, basically. So will we see this type of you know, nationally controlled per se blockchain emerge in some places and some markets? And will there be some significant, significant activity there uh, is maybe one possibility. Oh, I actually have an, uh, another interesting story about uh, dead blockchains. Um, so one of my uh, coworkers and friends, uh, Chris Goes, uh, he, he works with me on Cosmos, but uh, he has a side project called Wyvern. It's like a decentralized exchange he's built on top of Ethereum. And for this exchange project, he wanted a token that uh, for purposes of governance, uh, like a, he wanted a DAO that kind of controls like, like the upgrade or path of the chain. But, you know, he didn't want to do like an ICO or anything like that. Um, and so what he did was he went on Bitcoin talk and like just went to like, and just like flip through like super old dead threads of like dead chains. And he found this one called Wyvern uh, of this like coin from like 2014 or something, 2013 of like a proof of work chain. The chain's completely dead. No one's mining on it. It's like just a completely halted chain. And he just like messaged that Bitcoin thread forum and he's like Bitcoin forum th thread. And he's like, hey, I'm launching this new project. I want to, uh, I want a token distribution. Uh, are you if I just airdrop all my all all these tokens to like you know the last known distribution of this chain, would you guys be like willing to jump on and like take over this like project uh, like the like you know be the DAO holders of this Wyvern Dex I'm building and like you know it worked somehow and like you know he actually has like a little community kicking around just from like reviving a dead project, which I thought was kind of like very interesting. Now that we've covered all these questions from the MA, and thank you to those who asked questions, maybe spend a little bit of time on you know, 2018 and you know, the events uh, of, of last year. Uh, so maybe to all of you, I would ask, what is the most important thing that happened in 2018? What sticks out in your mind as the most significant event? Well, I think the most important thing certainly is the bear market, right? So the, the complete collapse of prices, you know, I mean, the, the change that's gone through is so enormous. You know, you had all of these mainstream people in. I remember like Christmas last year, 
everybody was asking about blockchain and Bitcoin. Should I buy this? You know, nobody cares. So you and and then pro, you know, you have SEC going after project. So I think just that this bear market is 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 like a huge thing, and it's not clear exactly what are all of the second and third order consequences. So I I also remember reading some articles where people talked about. Uh, you know, for example, crypto funds, right? When crypto funds like collapse in their assets under management, like economically, it doesn't really become that meaningful anymore for the fund managers to like keep going because they have to go up so much until they actually make money or they earn too little to pay for their operations, right? So what happens when all of these crypto funds shut down? So that could be sort of a second order consequence. But uh, I'm really curious, what what are these consequences that we're not seeing yet of this bear market. Yeah, I, I also think it's the bear market, um, but I see a different a different facet as well. So now that um, a lot of the investors and uh, uh, blockchain tourists have departed, um, it, it, it changes the energy of, uh, of the space in, in the way that uh, it makes it more amenable towards people who actually build stuff and gives them time and takes off the pressure um, to to present done projects. And it just gives gives people to actually build uh, time to build solid technology. And of course, there's a flip side to that. So in the past couple of weeks, we've seen huge layoffs in many big established companies in the space. And obviously, there's a lot of hurt that comes with that. But I think for the ecosystem as a whole, uh, this has the potential to be a really good thing. So yeah, kind of like going off of that, um, you know, what I thought, like, despite the bear market, what I thought was very like promising in 2018 was we saw the launch of a lot of uh, big projects. So, you know, we saw the launch of a lot of big dApps like Zero X, uh, Augur, uh, Maker. Maker was kind of in the tail end of 2017, but like, you know, in December, so it really like, kicked off in 2018. Um, and then as well as a lot of new platforms like EOS and Tezos. So, you know, this is kind of, it, it, despite, it, it was, you know, in heart, heartening to see that, like, uh, despite the bear market, like people were still building stuff and launching stuff and, you know, the, the space is still moving forward despite the price crash. I think it'll force companies to really, you know, think differently about how they're building products. I think one thing that I would say is probably a good thing is to try to solve your own problems. Uh, I think that's a, a very underrated uh, aspect of like building a product is building something that's meaningful to you and uh, building products that normal people can use. So in this, in this bear market where resources are now all of a sudden for a lot of people very scarce, um, you know, learning how to be frugal and and experimenting with with less and being more lean, um, I think it's probably a good thing for the ecosystem as a whole. And it would be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. So, you know, in the next, let, let's say this bear market continues and we sort of enter a crypto winter, much like the one of 2014 when Bitcoin was hovering around 200 to 300 dollars. If if we stick into this bear market for maybe two or three years, uh, once again, or or more, who knows? Uh, it'll be interesting to see what we, what people will have built during that time and um, and how that will have affected sort of the teams building things. I, I think if if the bear market is going to last that long, and I don't think that's impossible, um, I think it'll it'll impact the ecosystem in a third way, and that that's not going to make projects leaner. That's going to make a lot of projects dead. Uh, <laughs> so so there'll be uh, there'll be places, spaces to fill that were previously occupied by other companies that somehow didn't make it. I mean, often it is said that there's a second mover advantage to people uh, just because the first mover has so much stuff to figure out. Uh, and I think uh, it'll, it'll, that'll also uh, mark the influx of a, a whole different set of new people with new ideas uh, tackling old problems. Another question we can address here. So what are, what are the most important things that you feel are going on, you know, today in the blockchain space or, or in the year ahead? So 
So let's uh, maybe start with you, Sebastian. If I look back on the last, you know, five years, and when when Bitcoin began, you know, when I when I became interested in Bitcoin, I remember people telling me that one of the major barriers to entry for them as sort of a mainstream adopter was the price volatility. And to that extent, I think that stable coins, I mean, people are talking about stable coins an awful lot within the space, but outside of the space and in the more general population, I think has a massive potential for really making apps usable and dApps adoptable in a sense, uh, where someone comes in and to the ecosystem and wants to use an application. Of course, there has to be products for that. And it very much ties to my, my previous point about building things that people want to use. But having a stable currency that allows people to lend money, or borrow money, um, and it kind of ties into the decentralized finance space. But that's kind of the base layer um, that, that the entire ecosystem needs. You know, should it have aspirations to build communities with hundreds and thousands and hundreds and thousands of users. I have two things that come to my mind of, you know, it's kind of like really big impactful things going on. I mean, first of all, and, you know, Sonny could even speak much more about that, but I'm you know, very excited about the launch of Cosmos. And, uh, of course, you know, I've been started working on Cosmos uh, over two years ago. And and first at the Cosmos team and then independently with, or with Chorus One. And now it's finally like almost there with Game of Stakes and there's like a live network with 200 validators and it's like super active and the, it's it's working really well, it seems at this point. So that's, that's really exciting. And I think that is going to be a major, major thing because you'll be able to have blockchains that are, you know, highly performant and highly secure and fast and can scale. So I'm I'm excited about that. And another thing that comes to mind is just the ability to earn earn money, you know, using your crypto. So staking on Tezos, right, is like one example, right? You can stake your Tezos and earn some money. And in Ethereum, lots of things are emerging where you can like lend Ether and stuff like that. And I think that's that's going to be also a huge thing, right? In the future, soon you'll be able to earn probably money with, on, on much of your cryptocurrencies. And, and there's like so many different types of infrastructure and applications that need to be built around that. So yeah, thanks for the shout out for Cosmos. Um, so, you know, obviously I'm very excited about Cosmos as well. Like it's, uh, a lot, I've been doing a lot of stuff on the proof of stake side of things. So I'm pretty excited to see proof of stake hopefully actually like, you know, work in like a large public setting uh, with, you know, with like the full incentive systems that we've been working on. Uh, and then the other part of Cosmos that I'm actually pretty uh, excited about, though, is the application specific blockchains. And that's not even like a Cosmos specific thing. It's just a, you know, general ecosystem thing where, you know, I, I, I like this shift that I'm seeing in a lot of things, like whether it's in Cosmos or Polkadot or like Loom, for example, a lot of projects have been like starting to shift towards like a framework of like application specific blockchains where you're not running your your dap on a smart contracting system you're instead running it on a specialized chain that's like custom designed for your use case which i i'm pretty excited about um and then the other thing that i'm pretty excited about uh, that i see a good trend going on right now is a lot of development in uh new cryptographic primitives so i think there was like a set of cryptographic primitives we had access to uh, 10 years ago uh, when Bitcoin first came out with like, you know, we had like, you know, Merkle trees and uh, public key cryptography and whatnot. But and I think we've kind of explored the entire design space of like putting together these like existing technologies in like different configurations. Uh, and like, I think any like new developments at the protocol level uh, are coming from and will have to come from newer cryptography. Uh, and so it's really, you know, promising to see a lot of people doing a lot of work on like zero knowledge proof stuff. Um, I think like RSA accumulators are gonna change a lot of, like make things a lot more efficient and like open up a new realm of possibilities. Um, a lot of cool stuff happening right now with like MP multi-party computation and uh, threshold signatures. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, hopefully seeing a lot 
more cooler cryptographic primitives that will enable much more interesting protocols. Cool. So with that, we're at the end of the episode. Uh, well, thank you all for for being here today and uh, for coming on the show to talk. Uh, I really like these these uh, these episodes where we're just us hosts. Uh, we don't do it often, but uh, it is it is nice to do it once a year and kind of wrap up and and get to talk amongst ourselves, uh, amongst each other rather. Um, so thank you to our listeners for tuning in and thank you for being with us for the last five years and hopefully. Uh, you'll stay with us for the years to come and we'll be happy to continue uh, bringing you Epicenter every week and uh, yeah, being a voice in the space. So thanks again and we look forward to speaking next week.